I guess we should get started. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to make it here today. My name is Scott Wingo, and I served as the editor-in-chief for the inaugural issue of the Georgetown Journal of Asian Affairs. We have a great lineup of speakers today and are glad you could join us to celebrate the journal's first issue. Our journal aims to be relevant to both academic and policy discussions through the publication of both longer peer-reviewed articles and shorter policy-oriented articles and interviews. We hope to publish fresh perspectives from academics, practitioners, and students on current issues regarding the politics, security, economics, and societies of the world's most populous and economically fastest growing region. In that light, we chose negotiating growth in Asia as the theme of the <coughs> first issue. The idea of growth is pervasive in Asia today. This is most obvious in the economic sense of the word. Billions of people across the region are emerging from poverty in what must be considered history's greatest economic success story to date. Asia is now the world's manufacturing hub and is increasingly a source of technological innovation. This transformation has far-reaching effects on actors both inside and outside the region. Our inaugural issue's theme, Negotiating Growth in Asia, is about how governments and citizens alike react to these changes. At the international level, China's economic growth is fueling a corresponding rise in its geopolitical profile, and this rapid ascension is impossible to ignore. As the home of the world's largest population and second largest economy, China has unique potential to fundamentally alter the regional and global geopolitical order. Asian states are responding to China's rise in a variety of manners, as is exemplified in a piece in our issue by CSIS's own Ellen Kim on new developments in Sino-South Korean relations and the U.S.-South Korea Security Alliance. Today, Mr. Christopher Johnson will speak about the rise of China and its geopolitical ramifications in Asia. Within states, too, economic growth has the potential to create political change. According to a variety of theories and historical precedents, economic growth and democratization frequently go hand in hand, and prospects for political reform are another important component of growth in Asia. Our first issue includes writings on democratization in the developing states of Myanmar, Thailand, and Indonesia, as well as a very timely article on the implications of Hong Kong's recent protests for the future of governments, not only in Hong Kong, but also in Taiwan and mainland China. Asia's patterns of governance are very much in flux, and Dr. Apachai Shipper will speak today about what might lie ahead for the continent. Finally, economic growth itself creates a raft of issues for policymakers to negotiate. Inequality sometimes stubbornly abides in the face of growth and policymakers must strive to find ways to ensure that Asia's growth does not leave behind many of the region's people. At the same time, political complications can hinder economic growth. In this light, our first issue includes articles on the politics of economic reform in India and on North Korean citizens' attempts to bolster their own food security through black market channels. Ambassador Robert Orr will discuss possibilities for the future trajectory of growth in Asia. I would like to thank everyone who helped to create our first issue. Our authors, reviewers, publishers, and editorial staff put great effort into launching an all-new journal, and their hard work is appreciated. Thanks also go out to Dr. Victor Cha and the staff of the Asian Studies Department at Georgetown University, who all played major roles in the establishment of the journal, and for CSIS for agreeing to host us here today. Finally, we would like to thank our speakers for agreeing to join us today and our readers for their support. Without further ado, Dr. Cha will introduce our speakers. Thanks, Scott. Um, so um, before I introduce the speakers, I just want to um, echo the congratulations to the journal for its first issue. Um, if you haven't been able to pick up a copy, uh, I think we have copies, some outside, and then you can also see it online. It's, we, they, we really tried to be different with this journal in the sense that there are scholarly pieces, but there are shorter op-ed pieces, um, and we're trying to feature sort of the new younger voices uh, on Asian policy as well as uh, senior scholars in this. So we're quite happy with this first issue. It's been quite successful. We're using CSIS today as a platform um, to, um, to celebrate the journal. And I want to Scott, thank Scott uh, and the editorial team, uh, as well as Daye uh, Shim Lee uh, in our program at Georgetown, who has been instrumental also in, in, in bringing this journal to creation. So really, congratulations to you guys. You deserve all the credit, and we just expect better and better things to come. So, um, uh, But 
we knew that that wasn't the only reason you would come today, so <laughs> we decided to put together a panel of people and give you some food. Um, and so the theme, as Scott said, is negotiating growth in Asia. And, and um, it's a broad enough theme so that our speakers can take different aspects of it. Um, uh, we think it's a fantastic panel of people, and I will introduce you, them to you very briefly um, uh, because I think they're well known to most of you. Uh, at, my far, at the far right end is Christopher Johnson, who is the Freeman Chair here at CSIS in China Studies, as well as a senior advisor. Um, for, Chris comes from many, many years as one of the senior analysts on China in the U.S. intelligence community and is really one of the, the best uh, scholars um, and practitioners on, on China and Chinese leadership. Um, speaking next is Apichai Shipper. Uh, Apichai teaches for us at Georgetown in the graduate program in Asian Studies where he is um, an adjunct associate professor. He previously taught at USC uh, and is currently the uh, Asia Regional Chair at the Foreign Service Institute. Uh, for the State Department. And then, of course, Ambassador Skip Orr, who is currently the U.S. Executive Director to the Asian Development Bank, uh, but Skip has also held many uh, quite uh, prestigious positions as Chairman of the Board of the Panasonic Foundation, as President of Boeing Japan, as well as Vice President and Director for European Affairs for Motorola. Um, he's fighting a bad cold today, so we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, we can get you some hot tea or something if you'd like along the way. So, Thank you. Um, I know that Chris has to catch either a plane, train, or boat to go somewhere, so I'm going to let him go first uh, on the topic of uh, growth as it relates to China. Great. So, Thanks, Victor. Yeah. Uh, and let me just uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here, and I'm, I'm very happy to be associated with the journal uh, through its advisory board as well. So I'm very pleased with that position and uh, thankful for that opportunity. And I actually uh, read through <laughs> the pieces uh, during the holiday break, and I really think it's an outstanding piece. So I'm, I'm very proud of all the work that was done. Um, you know, obviously China's uh, growth and rise in influence is a huge topic. Uh, I think I've been giving the, uh, the time of 14 minutes or something like that, so let me think about some ways to think about it. I, I think the main thing and the main theme to sort of strike, and it runs, I think, through a lot of the articles and pieces in the, in the first issue, is this notion of how, two questions. One, what kind of China does China want to be now that it is uh, rising in this way? And two, how is the region uh, thinking about that and how do they intend to, to react or identify with that? I think the answer to the first question is very complex. Uh, my sense is that this is a decade-long debate that will go on maybe longer uh, inside China. Um, we're beginning to see the parameters of where the current leadership <laughs> under Xi Jinping uh, tends to define this notion and the direction that they're probably going in. Um, I would recommend to everybody in the audience, if they haven't done so, take a very good look at the excerpts that were released. Uh, Xi Jinping gave a sort of very major keynote speech at this Central Foreign Affairs Work Conference last month. Um, it is, uh, these events are very rare. They only happen maybe once every five years, once a decade. It's been since 2006, uh, was the last one under Hu Jintao. And it really <coughs> the opportunity to define uh, his foreign policy vision for China. And I think if there's a bumper sticker that came out of the speech, uh, which was quite lengthy, uh, it, the idea is uh, we're here, get used to it. Uh, that's sort of the approach. Uh, and it's a much more proactive uh, sort of flavor uh, to Chinese foreign policy than we've seen in the past. Uh, I think a challenge is how do you think about this in terms of, well, what does proactive or active mean? I think it's hard in this town in particular to try to take a nuanced approach uh, and not suggest that active somehow means aggressive or you know pushy or so on. I think it's just active. Uh, and for now, we have to watch and see what China's going to do. But, but in that document, in that speech, it's very, very clear <coughs> that Xi Jinping's view is that China is the center of the region. Um, will continue to be so in the future. And what's really interesting is that there's a fundamental shift in the way I think he and the Chinese leadership writ large are defining how the region is growing and China's role in that. You know, previously, I think, with concepts that they've had, like the period of strategic opportunity, um, peaceful development, things like this, the notion has been China's very benign. They have benefited uh, very much from this benign external environment that has allowed them to focus on their internal development. And that's a gift, if you will, to them. 
that is fragile and to be cherished and, and so on, and that within the limits of China's capabilities, they would seek to prolong that period of strategic opportunity and to push out the parameters uh, of that sort of benign external environment. I think in Xi Jinping's uh, speech, while he recognizes the term period of strategic opportunity, he's basically redefining it in his own terms, where China is very much the engine of what's happening in the region, especially on the economic growth side. And so I think as much as we talk about China's branching out in the maritime space and the South China Sea, East China Sea, and so on, the thing that really strikes me about the speech is Xi Jinping's clear goal to establish an economic framework in the region. Because I think what we see coming out of that is his recognition of this fundamental notion that in the region, economics is security. And he's trying to draw a very strong contrast, I think, with those comments between what he sees the US doing, or I think we'd all agree not doing with regard to TPP. Uh, and so on, and what China is attempting to do. So you see that at APEC, he signs FTAs with South Korea, with, uh, with Australia, lots of talk about FTAP as an organization and so on, and then the speech you know, immediately follows that. It's all an orchestrated whole. And so I think then the question becomes, how is the region itself going to react to this development? How are they going to think about uh, what options do they have to consider, uh, <coughs> given that this is the, the goal that China seems to be pursuing? And I think as the United States, we have to think about what role we're going to play in that. Uh, and for the region, I think it's very much how do they, I mean, we've seen this pattern now for some time, but I think it's been amplified in the last few years. How do they take advantage of China's economic growth and dynamism while still maintaining their own uh, sort of sense of self and not being drawn into a Chinese-driven orbit or system <clears throat> in the region? And, you know, I think if you look at what's happened over the last year in particular, uh, again, some fairly forward-leaning behavior by China and South China Sea elsewhere, uh, a bit of a immune response from the region and some dialing back, you know, from the Chinese in terms of their approach. Uh, the warming or, you know, thawing, I guess you could say, with Japan, although it's been interesting, there hasn't been much follow-up since the meeting between Abe and Xi Jinping. Uh, obviously, in the South China Sea, I think we're seeing a sort of calming uh, influence happening there. And so the question is, how durable uh, is all of that? Or was it just designed to kind of get them through APEC smoothly? And what are they going to do this year? Um, obviously, we've got a couple of key challenges challenges there, one with the 70th anniversary of World War II, which will make it very difficult for certain parties inside China to resist the opportunity to go hard on the history issue uh, with the Japanese. And then, of course, while things have not been as contentious with Vietnam or the Filipinos in recent months, all of the sort of pressing and work continues unabated in terms of uh, land reclamation, heavy patrolling, you know, all this sort of stuff that we've seen. So Xi Jinping has been talking a lot internally about the new <coughs> normal in terms of China's economic development model, uh, which means slower growth, higher quality growth, et cetera. I think there's a new normal in foreign policy too. And it's this notion that you know, the Chinese are going to be very present. They're going to be very active in the region. And they do have an intention to build some of these, what you could be described as parallel structures that while perhaps not directly competing with things like the Bretton Woods system, certainly are designed to act as Asia unique uh, manifestations of a similar model. And how do we as the United States and the region deal with those? Do we try to, in a way, force the Chinese into uh, integrating those institutions into the existing institutions? Uh, or do we accept that there's another pathway and that those institutions can exist independently? And I don't think China has been entirely clear yet in defining for itself <coughs> to run those institutions. There's a lot of commentary publicly that these institutions are a dagger pointed at the heart of the Bretton Woods system. I mean, my own view is that that's rather laughable simply because China doesn't have the capacity uh, or the intention uh, to engage in that kind of behavior um, at this point in time. For the U.S. side, I mean, my strong sense is it starts with a recognition that the, the ground has actually shifted in the region. I think we've been, the administration has been slow uh, to acknowledge this. I think they are now. Certainly, they've talked a lot about uh, China's rise and the implications thereof and the U.S. strategy in trying to bring China onto the world stage, but also reminding China that uh, there are agreed upon rules and norms in the region. Um, but this very dramatic shift in the foreign policy toward this more active stance, I think we've been slow uh, to uh, come to terms with that and think about how we're going to react. And to me, that's what's going to define this new style of great power relations, as the Chinese like to call it, or major country relations, between the United States and China is how do we allow for that rise while maintaining, obviously, our 
own presence, interest, influence in the region, and you know, doing our best to see if China will accommodate to these sort of global rules and norms, even though they didn't have a hand in, in shaping most of them. So I think that's going to be the fundamental challenge uh, for this century and probably beyond in terms of adjusting to China's rise in power. Great. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Very good. Uh, after time. Yes, uh, first I want to uh, congratulate the Georgetown Journal of um, Asian Studies, um, or Asian Affairs, and particularly congratulations to you, uh, Georgetown University and to the uh, Georgetown University Asian Studies program, and to you as well, um, Victor Shah, for putting uh, this together, as well as um, uh, a, a great journal. Although I have not uh, seen yet, but I've seen some of, I've been a reviewer for one of the um, uh, articles there. Um, so it looks uh, quite prom promising. And um, so I congratulate all of the students involved in that journal. And um, if I could be of any help or assistance in the near future, let me know. Um, as you know, uh, I'm also employed by, uh, by, by Victor. Um, also, thank you to, um, to everyone here who attending. And um, as I am also a government official, I am here as a Georgetown uh, University researcher. And I'm here at a private capacity. And what I say is all my views are not the view of the US government, or the State Department, or the Foreign Service Institute. Um, so when I first studied political economy of development about uh, a decade and a half ago, um, and first taught uh, political economy of development, um, one of the main theories that we study was modernization theory and the argument for and that theory is that as a country develop economically and grow, um, uh, it will become more and more democratic. There's many variations of, of that theory and um, so many scholars, many researchers, they want to find out if this is whether true or not and they, they examined um, maybe a country at what level of economic development does it become uh, a democratic country at 5,000 GDP per capita or 6,000 GDP per, per capita. Um, other also look at at what point do we recognize a country as a uh, democracy when there's a regular change uh, of government or transition in government or is there an assistance of uh, competitive parties or is there an assistant, uh, existence of social equality within a, in, in the society. I think so many very scholars have actually tried to address these issues um, for the past two decades <coughs> in some way or the other. And as, a, as a, somebody who's trained in comparative political science, um, that is, it is one of the theories that we explore quite, uh, quite seriously. And in my areas of studies and research in Asia, and we look, when we look at the experiences in Asia and see how does these theories really apply to Asia, we see that maybe in northern, in Northeast Asian countries like uh, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, this maybe it appears to apply to those, to those countries because as you see, as they become more modernized, um, they become actually more quite uh, democratic, uh, particularly in the past two uh, decades or so. But the rest of it, <coughs> it looked actually it looked quite different. And this is where um, uh, the theories may not apply so, so well. Particularly if you look at um, places like uh, such countries like China, like Vietnam, um, it has been growing very fast uh, for decades, I think, for the past two decades, but there seems to be no sign of a democratic transition. Um, however, I think what is really a true sign, maybe that you don't see so much of democratic transition. I think what's, you know, so you don't see as high as increase of economic growth and development, then you will see uh, an, an increase in democracy. But I think what you, could, you definitely see in these socialist countries when you see higher growth and fast growth, you probably see also, also see an increase in corruption um, as well. And I think the country is trying to deal with, with that situation, how to deal with corruption and trying to uh, police their uh, bureaucrats and politicians. Um, when, when I look at Southeast Asian countries today, um, who would have thought two decades ago that uh, the, the shining lights of Southeast Asian democracy would be Indonesia, right? Um, after th over three decades of, uh, of, uh, of Suhat <coughs> school, um, and today I think um, by many people's standards, um, you know, Indonesia seems to be, look quite good. Um, in terms of democratic, democratic, uh, uh, on the democratic front. In fact, I think many scholars, particularly Southeast Asian scholars um, in the late 1990s, would have predicted that the best prospect for democratic development and democracy in Southeast Asia would have been Thailand. 
Look at Thailand today. It's under author uh, military authoritarian rule uh, with uh, restrictive freedoms in that uh, country. Um, and if you look in terms of other countries as well, if you look at um, that, that modernization theory does not apply, it does not work so well. If you look, at, for example, at Myanmar or Burma, here is, I think, the arrow is going reverse because actually uh, Myanmar um, actually democratized first before it reached um, growth. So um, that does not work so well. I think um, if it's, it's, it, it raises very interesting uh, uh, questions in, um, among scholars and as well as policymakers. I think that um, when you look at, at mainland Southeast Asia, it appears that Myanmar or Burma or even Cambodia look actually more <coughs> democratic in mainland Southeast Asia. And who have thought that? Uh, two decades ago, when many people think, oh, look at Thailand and, and what Thailand uh, uh, will, will be doing. Um, so these countries, I think, they defy modernization theories um, because if you look at where they were, how they were transformed. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Another aspect, aspect of it is also to look at, um, at the, how, did, how did these countries were transformed. For example, Indonesia was transformed to become a more democratic uh, society. society after the Asian financial crisis in 1997. So it was a crisis that actually stimulated the, uh, the fall of Suharto and, all of, uh, and what, what came after, afterwards. Um, in Thailand as well, um, Thailand actually, after 1997, it, it actually became more, it wasn't really a democratic country, it became more and more democratic uh, societies as it revised its constitution right, right after the, the crisis. And, um, its, its, its market and its, uh, and its politics became more and more decentralized. Um, and it passed one of the most democratic uh, constitutions in its, in its history. So um, in the case of Thailand, in democracies hit with an with a economic crisis actually result in a deepening of democracy in that society. Um, and Myanmar and Burma is quite interesting because that's a, that's a country that actually um, it, it, it democratized first through the military, um, which allow for economic development growth today. And if you look in terms of the military, I just came back from, uh, from Burma, um, uh, I was there just last week, and even looking at the military today, it look, it, internally it, actually, it actually look more democratic than even its opposition parties. Um, even in the USDP, that is the military um, uh, government, where you see the, in terms of advisories and in terms of structure of governance, it actually look quite democratic in, in terms of structure. Whereas the, um, NDL, um, the, the NDL, I'm sorry, the NLD uh, party, the party of the opposition of, of Aung San Suu Kyi, um, is much more hierarchical and much more top-down in terms of its structure. So it, even within its military uh, uh, and, and within its um, political parties, you see a much more democratic um, structure, which, had, you know, which has a lot of great prospect for people um, here in DC when we look at um, uh, what, what, what will happen to, to Burma after the election this, um, this summer. Um, and so the case, of, and what is interesting about, um, about Thailand um, is that um, in Thailand, um, he suffered gravely because of the military, military coups that happened in the past two <coughs> decades. And this is one of the reasons why um, uh, I think growth and democracies has not played, you see a correlation between uh, democracy and growth and because of the nature of the military in, in Thai politics. Unlike other societies, unlike the United States, where you see the military is under um, civilian control, the Thai militaries are, are not under civilian control. If anything, they are under um, the control, or I should say, the, to, be, to be exact, because I can get in trouble with, uh, uh, with, with this, to be exact, the Thai military um, appears to be, um, they pledge allegiance to the king, how's that? Um, so, but they don't have civilian, uh, under civilian control. Um, and uh, so as a result, coups actually happened um, in, in, um, in Thailand quite often, and they, they pose as a constraint to Thai democratization. 
Um, we can also see some similarity with other countries in Southeast Asia, like Singapore or in Malaysia as well, in terms of its, its, its rise, in terms of economic, uh, economic rise, as well as democracy. We have regular elections in those, in those, country, in those two countries. But they're usually dominated by one party. In you know, Singapore, it's by the PAP, the People Action Party. In uh, Malaysia, it's, it's UMNO. Uh, so it's not completely uh, democratic in, in that sense. <clears throat> so in my conclusion on, on, in, in terms of uh, coloration, I see no economic growth. I see that economic growth has no correlation with democracy and, de and democratic development in Southeast Asia. But it's not to say that I'm pessimistic about, uh, about the future of growth and, and democracy in, in Asia. So, um, because um, although I don't see a structural transformation for democratization in these countries, that, that, that is, you don't see a structural change in those soci societies. I actually, uh, in my own research, I have seen um, a progress towards uh, uh, democratic deepening in certain societies in Asia. And as we witness them through the process of policy changes, especially those policies um, in regards to citizenship and foreign workers. And those are the areas that I do research. And most of my students here know quite well and my this argument quite well. So I'm not going to go into detail, but the, 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 to summarize the argument is that um, when you look at, at uh, what's happening in Asia um, of late um, in terms of economic growth, economic growth is also accompanied by a growth in migrant workers, um, both internally as well as internationally. And these people are the forces for, uh, for, uh, for transformation in those, societies, in those societies. Not structural transformation per se, but, uh, but transformation through uh, small, and, and, and consistent uh, incremental changes through policies. Because as those um, people, migrant workers, move from one country to, to another, they also, um, they also ignite as activism, social movements, particularly among small social groups like NGOs, to, that are trying to uh, push the society, so the society, so society to, uh, to pass laws that will change, that will become more accommodating to, to foreigners in terms of citizenship laws labor laws, laws against trafficking. Um, so the list of laws are very ex extensive in all of those, in many of these um, uh, advanced, uh, advanced soci societies in Asia, particularly in Northeast Asia, like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And it's also, it's, it's also taking place also in Southeast Asia, like Thailand itself, where it is experienced about uh, an influx of foreign workers coming from um, Cambodia, Burma, and, and Laos. And um, although the country structurally is not democratic, we see some of the little laws and the, um, that are, they're considering in terms of changing and amending become much more democratic in terms of trying to be more accommodating uh, towards, uh, uh, towards foreigners um, in, those, in those societies. So in that sense, I actually see, I'm quite optimistic that um, Asian society, society and countries will become more and more, you will see more and more um, democratic deepening in those societies as a result of internal uh, as well as international migration. I didn't mention internal one, but this one is Chris probably uh, can, do, can deal with much uh, deeply with in terms <coughs> of um, the internal migrants in China and the, the moving from the western part to the eastern uh, 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 sections of uh, the eastern ports of China. And as we saw, you have about more than 200 millions of those internal migrants uh, working in, in the eastern coast. And the situation um, that to deal with the hukou or family re uh, registration is one of the <coughs> concerns that the Japanese and the Chinese government is um, is thinking, and the leadership are trying to revise because they have to think how to deal and how to, how to accommodate those internal migrants. So these movements of people within um, Asia and uh, between Asian countries, I think, are the forces uh, for democratic um, change in, in, those, in those societies. And, and, and I have a great, uh, uh, very optim optimistic and great hope for the future of Asia, as, uh, precisely because of, of that. So I'll stop. Hey. So we've heard about power, and we've heard about democracy, and now we're going to hear about money. <laughs> <laughs> so Ambassador Orr, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Professor Shaw. I just want to, and I'm sorry if my voice sounds like a bullfrog, but <laughs> nothing to do that. Uh, I, I also want to congratulate Georgetown for the launch of the Journal of Asian Studies. You know, I have to say that when I saw people like Victor and Mike Green and whatnot coming all over, coming to Georgetown, I knew that the game had changed at Georgetown uh, because 
frankly, when I was a, a student, a graduate student at Georgetown, um, Asian studies was nowhere. Of course, that was just after the American Civil War. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about where Asia has come from. In many ways, it will be reflective of some of the things that you, you have both said. And, you know, I'm actually um, a Japan hand more than more broadly, and that's one of the reasons why the Obama administration sent me to to the Asian Development Bank because it's basically managed by the Japanese, and they'd never had someone with that background there. And uh, I think it's helped. Maybe it hasn't, but uh, it, I've done my best at any rate. Um, Japan was in tatters, of course, in 1945, and by by 56, you could see the trajectory beginning to change. But I always chart the real launch of Japan. Um, I mean, to to the extent that it was a very different kind of developing country to the 1964 Olympic Games, where a great deal of infrastructure <coughs> was, built, was brought in. For example, many of you know the bullet train. That's a World Bank project, you know. The, the highway structure of Tokyo was all World Bank. Um, and so, uh, and at the same time, and again, kind of looking a little bit like China, it was the second largest borrower of, uh, of uh, World Bank loans next to India. It, it sort of mirrors China because in our case, everybody, in, at least in not only this administration, but in past administrations, as China has risen, been trying to figure out how we can graduate China. Um, because China, you know, as some people in, uh, in uh, the administration have said to me, <coughs> how, can we, how can the ADB support a, China as the largest borrower when it has a manned space program? Um, and so, you know, that's a legitimate point. From the perspective of the banks, like Asian Development Bank or World Bank, they, they, they appear as the best customers because they, they are very, you know, responsive to paying back and whatnot. But for the United States, when we look at uh, China, I'd say over 50% of the loans that come before the ADB board, we have to abstain on. Um, and the only things that we can really support is if it is, ex these are loans extended to the poorest parts of the country in the West. And there is a basic human needs element. But we put in a conundrum because, for example, not so long ago, um, I had to abstain from a project that actually made a lot of sense. And that was a clean bus system in Beijing, clean energy, which is something normally we would support. But because it's in Beijing, <clears throat> and there's no basic human needs element to it, we couldn't support it. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of you know, challenge that we have. Um, you know, if you look back at the 1950s, think about South Korea and Taiwan. I mean, these were, these were backwater economies, and not even back to the 50s, uh, really, the 60s, and even the early 70s. I mean, they were, this, you didn't really talk about them in serious terms, and now they're global leaders. And that's remarkable progress. Uh, in the region, I think. So what is Asia? Well, Asia, of course, is, is incredibly diverse. Um, it includes the strongest economies, as I mentioned, Japan, Hong Kong, Republic of Korea, Singapore, the second largest economy in the world, China, uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, is also the largest borrower of, of loans. Also, like India and Indonesia and <clears throat> Vietnam, there are middle-income countries. What, and as of recent years, for example, what are the fastest growing economies in Asia? Well, Cambodia and Mongolia reached 20% in, in 2011, which is, I think, uh, quite, quite unique. So a, in Asia, these countries coexist with numerous small, small underdeveloped economies, such as Afghanistan, Timor-Leste, Nepal, and all of those Pacific Island states. You know, um, we estimate that, uh, rather, you know, the ADB estimates that because of the challenges of, of climate change, we have 12 borrowers who are from the Pacific Island states. We predict within 15 years we'll have five because they won't be there anymore. Uh, and that's a real challenge for the, 
for those in the bank as we go forward and trying to figure out how to support them. Um, but it's a region with a lot of paradoxes. It's the world's fastest growing region and still has nearly half of the world's poor, poorest, who live on less than a buck and a quarter a day. Uh, while the hub of manufacturing and its services, vast numbers of its people are illiterate and unemployed. So you've got that, that dynamic climax uh, uh, contradiction between very fast growing and then the fall behinds. <clears throat> They've got, Asia has these vastly rapid aging societies in the same region with, you know, like Japan and China, in the same region uh, of, with countries like Pakistan, Philippines, and many Central Asian states with really high population rates. Uh, give you a little thing, I mean, since I live in the Philippines, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, the population of the Philippines was eight million. Uh, and today it's about 110 million in that time period. And so the growth has been really, really dramatic. Um, um, to many uh, Asians, it's not really about the emergence of Asia, I would, I would argue. But in many ways, it, people, people in Asia have a deep sense of history. And I think to many in Asia, it's about the re-emergence mm. of Asia. Because before the period of colonialism, um, say before the 1700s, um, Asia uh, had a, uh, a, a larger, had late, larger economies than those in Europe at that time. And then after the advent of colonialism, it, it's taken a long time, you know, if we, to get back. At this rate, if, of development, in about uh, 30 years, Asia will have about, will be, have a GDP of about 40,500 per capita, which will be consistent with, with, with Europe uh, as a whole. Um, but, you know, with all of these possibilities for Asia, it's not, a, it's not an automatic. There are so many, uh, I think, uh, stumbling blocks that face the countries of Asia. Um, you know, biggest going forward issues are things like, while Asia <coughs> overall is, is, is marching forward with very dynamic economies, the inequality in these countries is significant. And it is a challenge for political instability. It is not an easy issue. So we often talk about inclusive growth in the ADB and in the World Bank uh, uh, in, that, in the sense that development cannot simply take place like it did um, in the past in Asia. In the past in Asia, I think in part because of this concern about recolonization, um, Asia you know, went forward with development irrespective of inclusive growth, irrespective of safeguards, Pollution issues were overwhelming. Take a look at China. <coughs> um, um, issues like resettlement, when major energy projects such as hydroelectric dams are, are made or are, are built, serious issues because sometimes these countries think about that last. Um, and, and it's a real challenge uh, also for the donors. Um, political leadership is a real challenge, I think, going forward in Asia, not only Asia, but um, I think that uh, the kind of political sh leadership um, that is, you know, reflects movement toward democratic order is, is vital. And uh, I think a lot of that is connected with education and the extent to which the populace, the voters, are educated about the issues in their own countries. Um, and and governance and institutional capacity um, are very key. And that also relates back to what I was saying about <laughs> safeguards, these governance issues. And by the way, I might add, even though this is not the thrust of my talk here, although I've been talking about this particular topic for a long time now, AIIB, which as many of you know, is the Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank that is, is coming to in China. One of the challenges that they're going to have is, is governance. Um, they have elected not to have a resident board. Uh, whether that will change or not, I can't say. But nonetheless, I think people in the Asian Development Bank uh, want to work together with the AIIB.
because you know they they will hopefully gain some strengths from the ADB. It's not going to go away. It's going to be there. It's going to be a player. But again, I just want to mention that because of good governance uh, and the fact that they are not going to they as of now will not have a resident board. Um, so, how is growth conceptualized in the region? Well, as I mentioned before, Asia was all about growth after World War II, at any price. So, labor, environment, human rights, often afterthoughts, as I mentioned. The whole idea was to catch up, drive, you know, catch up to the West. Uh, they weren't going to be, Asian countries were not going to be colonies again. Uh, although that has not precluded other East Asian countries trying to colonize on their own. I'm speaking mainly of, of, from the West. Um, poor people, bringing poor people out of poverty without land reform, however, is, is a really, it's almost a non-starter. Um, the, if you take a look at the Philippines, for example, where, ironically, General MacArthur was, you know, the, the was the, what's the word, commissioner uh, 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 of the Philippines for many years. Uh, there was no land reform. And in the Philippines today, the kind of crony system is quite intact. And there's this huge gap between the poorest and the, um, and the, and the moneyed. Uh, quite in contrast to Japan, where the, the land reform did come in, uh, where MacArthur did lead that in. And he had no opportunity to become cronies with the Japanese who didn't speak that much English anyway. And so it's a much more egalitarian society than you see in a lot of places in Asia. Um, um, power and growth. How does that interact with democracy? Well, as I, I mentioned before, um, I, I do think higher education is necessary. Um, because before, before education it takes place in many of these countries in Asia. You do see the the uh, the, uh, the elevation of strongmen in in local politics, who really control the political order in those countries. And over time, when when education uh, is further developed, the chances of that being held, I think, is less over time. You have to relate one more thing about Japan, because when Japan and these will be my last uh, remarks, but when Japan, uh, when the Americans came into Japan for the occupation, you know, the first thing, the priority was to democratize Japan. And the word in Japanese for democracy is minshu shugi, um, democracy, and it's very similar to Chinese, I'm told. Mm -hmm. um, but for the Japanese, they took the word democracy and they made a play on words with it. And they called it demo kurushi, but it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'll yield the floor. Thanks very much. <laughs> great. Thanks to all of our speakers for a great and excellent intervention. Um, so we have some time to have a discussion with the audience. Um, uh, in particular, if, if you have any questions on China specifically, you might take those first since um, uh, Chris has to leave uh, shortly. Chris? Sure. Uh, uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson, of course, Chris. There's a book, Chris, there. Um, TPP, and our Chinese friend, uh, you know, a year or so ago, it sounded like they thought this was all aimed at them. Terrible idea. Yeah. But they, oh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> talking about China and its evolving attitude, if that's correct, on TPP. Uh, a year or so ago, it looked like it was aimed at them. They don't have anything to do with it. Uh, and perhaps partly as a result of it, they launched some of these parallel uh, things. Um, how do you see that now? Uh, it, it, do the Chinese see a, uh, something more interesting about TPP, something more viable for them? Uh, and how do you see that playing out, assuming that at some point we will get a TPP? And that's something else we, we want to talk about. Thanks. <laughs> sure. Uh, I think, you know, we definitely have seen a shift. That's clear. Uh, and I think there's two primary drivers for that. The first was Japan's decision to get in. So from the geostrategic point of view, I think that's been the key driver in the shift. 
uh, of Chinese attitudes. When they saw that happen, they realized this thing is real uh, and will have you know, consequences for them. Obviously, if you get an economy the size of Japan's, obviously with the U.S. also involved, it starts to set the pilings, if you will, and the parameters for operating in the, in the region. Uh, I think also the Chinese were quick to assess uh, that the Japanese were very much doing so for, <coughs> more for geostrategic purposes than for economic purposes. I think that's quite obvious in the way that uh, Abe-san and others have uh, proceeded with their approach to TPP. So I think that was a big factor in terms of, I mean, quite literally, I can recall going to to meetings with the Chinese earlier on where they would literally laugh when the subject was raised because they just thought it wasn't serious, that it wasn't going to go anywhere. And when Japan got in, that was a big shift. Um, the other piece, I think, is that much like WTO was in the 1990s, there's a constituency inside the Chinese political elite who sees TPP as an external cudgel, if you will, to be able to do the hard things that they know they need to do anyway for the strength of their domestic economy. So using that, it's, it's much easier, for example, for the leadership to be able to go to state-owned enterprises and say, hey, we love you guys, but you know, if we're going to be a part of this thing, we have to do this, uh, even though it's difficult for us. And I think there are a lot of folks inside that kind of more reform-oriented camp who feel that TPP can play this, this role as well. I think they also, there's an increasing recognition, which there wasn't initially, that you know, this is the direction they have to go uh, themselves to unlock the next you know, sort of great wave of economic growth. So to the degree that TPP aligns with where they think they need to go already anyway, uh, that's attractive to them. What's been interesting just in the last several months, and I think the APEC meeting certainly um, had a lot of this flavor, is that you know, now you see <coughs> FTAP you know, very much sort of coming to the fore in their commentary. Xi Jinping was certainly um, addressing that very forthrightly in his comments around the APEC meeting. And so there's a question in my mind as to whether the Chinese see TPP as a you know, stepping stone, if you will, along the way toward a broader FTAP, which I think really is their, the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, which I think is really their, their long-term goal, or do they see even a bilateral investment treaty with the United States, which really is their primary focus right now, even before TPP, as another you know, sort of one of these stepping stones. And so I think there's very much an active debate inside the Chinese system over to how to view these individual trade and, and economic pieces and what role China may or may not play in them, and I think it's shifting, you know, on a fairly regular basis. Um, they're clearly trying, I think, in the last couple of months to paint for the region the strong contrast between what they're getting done, you know, in terms of practical terms, signing these agreements and so on, and the lack of movement on TPP. Indeed. <laughs> Next question? Yes. Ken Dillon, Science Press. I wonder if any of the panelists would like to uh, speak about the question of international competition in uh, science and technology and uh, the role of the need for, if, if such a need exists, for change in, in the institutions and in the patterns of, uh, of, of uh, training a new generation of scientists so that they can be originators, not just followers. Uh, I wonder if any of you would like to address that. I've got a few okay. comments and others please jump in. Uh, you know, this is a fundamental issue for the Chinese. Uh, I think we saw coming out of the Central Economic Work Conference um, in December a very heavy emphasis now on this innovation-led economy, right? This is the key to unlocking this next wave of growth that they talk about. And I think there's a broad recognition just really having taken hold between the time that the uh, now famous <coughs> third plenum tabled these reforms uh, uh, in the fall of 2013, there's this notion that they have to move up the value chain much faster than they previously had expected. You know, if you talk to people about this two years ago and you said, you know, how long do you think you can continue to play the string on the current economic development model, they all would say, you know, 10, 15, even 20 years. Now they say seven, five, three, you know, things like this. So they know they have to move very, very quickly. The trick is they haven't done the best job uh, of innovating. And, you know, this is a challenge. It's a very sensitive conversation that you have with folks in China where you, you know, sort of look at the track record and you say, strangely enough, for thousands of years, it was a highly innovative society and, and then this certain institution showed up and uh, they've been struggling with it since then. 
Um, and they know this is a problem. And unfortunately, you can't mandate innovation. You can't force innovation. <coughs> What's interesting to me that may be different, you know, their, their previous pattern on this has been to, to come up with very centrally planned, decade-long development plans. So there was the 863 program, there was the uh, 963 program to develop China's S&T infrastructure. Um, what we see now, I think, is a much more organic approach to that that kind of touches on some of the issues you raised, not just using government institutions and government training and think tanks, but trying to integrate the private sector, the developing private sector in. Um, the biggest one that I see is the, their approach to designing or developing their own semiconductor industry. Um, not only are they going to be throwing about, I think the fund now is up to about 160 <coughs> billion US dollars at the problem. Now, in the past, they've thrown a lot of money at similar problems and weren't able to achieve. But it's not just the money. It's uh, being supported very clearly by very high-level leaders in the system. There's also a strong integration of creating science parks, creating private sector-related uh, things to funnel into what the government is trying to do in an integrative strategy. So I do think they're thinking very fundamentally differently about this. How it shapes things like trade patterns is China's so-called going-out strategy, right? Investing uh, abroad has shifted fundamentally in the last couple years. Up until recently, it was very mineral and resource intensive. So the target markets were Latin America, Africa, places like that. Clearly, there's been a fundamental shift uh, in that approach. Uh, Xi Jinping is telling the community there, we have to look not for those kind of investments, which were of dubious quality and they lost a lot of money on some of these things, but more in this area of particularly picking up process engineering you know, uh, help, uh, know-how, tech, this sort of thing. And that shifts the, the markets they're shopping in to Europe, to North America. And we see them using a very wide uh, variety of tools, such as uh, everything from you know merger and acquisition, joint venture partnerships, greenfield investment. I mean, you name it. They're they're doing it across the board, and that has a much more. So instead of this sort of very internally focused China only model, we're trying to bring this stuff in through these acquisitions and so on. That's going to fundamentally change the approach, not just for them, but how others react to that. Other of our other panelists want to say something about innovation and technology. Uh, just a, a brief comment. I mean, I, I'm not. Uh, I don't. I haven't followed the science and tech area that closely in the re in recent years, but to the extent that I have, um, I noted that um, the the sort of uh, technological regime that I think that Chris was mentioning, to me, in some ways, echoes what I used to see in Japan, in the, in, particularly in the semiconductor industry when I was in Motorola. <coughs> Uh, and how the Japanese tried to le leverage their domestic industry and create it on their own uh, to a larger extent than, than had been in the past. And it was so dependent in the past on U.S., but it, it, it moved away from that model. So in some ways, I think it, it reflects what you've seen in China. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, <coughs> Brown. Yeah, Bill Brown from ODNI. Picking up on your going abroad topic, <coughs> and I'd like actually maybe all three of you could comment. Uh, another part of this going abroad that's much less advertised, I think, is a, a reform project. It's, it's kind of an experiment where they're linking the Shanghai, <coughs> excuse me, Shanghai stock market and the Hong Kong stock market. The, it's not working that well yet. It's going very slowly. But it's such an intriguing thought to me that Looking out ahead, it really does look like China is opening its capital market. Definitely. Which basically means our ordinary Chinese can invest here. Mm -hmm. So the going abroad right now, up until now, has been Chinese state enterprises, the right. government going abroad, maintaining their monopoly control over Chinese capital. Yeah. This open capital market blows that all away. Sure does. And an ordinary Chinese, maybe a richer ordinary Chinese, not a hugely rich, but sort of a middle, higher in income, presumably will be investing abroad. So my question is, how does that impact the politics of this monopoly state? Uh -huh. Seems like, you know, it's something, it could be quite transformative in creating competition within China for foreign policy issues uh -huh. and for their own politics. Any, any, any of y'all can 
Yes, I welcome comments for others. I'll just say quickly that you know this is the this is probably of all these reforms that they've tabled uh, at the third plenum, uh, and they're all very difficult in their own way. This may be the most difficult one, opening the uh, the capital account. In fact, I've been quite uh, impressed, really, by their courage uh, in in what they're doing already uh, in that process. You know, I think folks felt that this would you know of all those reforms that have this kind of 2020 benchmark for some kind of progress. I think most people argued that that one you wouldn't see anything until like late 20. 19, <laughs> something like that. They are moving it ahead. And I think it, a lot of it has to do with the determination of Joe Shachuan, the People's Bank governor, also the finance minister, Lo Jiwei. They're very sort of, this has been their life's project uh, in some ways to, to, to see this happen inside the Chinese system. I think the tension is exactly what you point out. On the one hand, you know, their desire to do this stuff with a capital account in some ways is much more driven by their ambitions in terms of being a part of the, a big kid in the international club than it is the economic fundamentals of it, right? There are a lot of arguments that would say the best thing for us is to keep it closed uh, because it's worked well for us. It helped us ride out the global financial crisis quite nicely, you know, things like this. Um, and so there's a lot of debate about inside the system about are we doing this for the right reasons and are we going to, are we risking losing our shirts here? You know, there was an interesting study that was done by McKinsey or somebody was talking about some, trying to estimate capital outflows uh, from China. Uh, and it was massive in, in uh, 2013. It increased rapidly after the tabling of these reforms. And that's with capital controls on, right? <laughs> so there's a real worry, I think, among some in the system that you know, if they open the window, all the birds are going to fly out, right? And what happens uh, in, in, in that scenario? So it's a very sensitive issue. Uh, it's a complex one. And I think it's one that they're grappling with on a regular basis. But make no mistake, fundamentally, that's where they want to go. The Hong Kong-Shanghai linkage is very interesting in that my own sense is that it's basically a test bed. And the Hong Kongers know this, that ultimately it's linking up with the London market, with New York. You know, these, that's the ambition. That's the goal. And moving toward a, the renminbi as an international currency. That's all part and parcel of it. This is why we see them pushing in a lot of these infrastructure deals and so on uh, to move toward convertibility <coughs> with the UN in the relationships that they're establishing. Um, they're definitely moving in this direction. And they see it as part of this, you know, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Okay. okay. Um, next question. Did you get some of the students to ask a question? <laughs> okay. Susan. And I'm at the Law Center. I, I run this, this small place called Law Asia. So we want anybody who has something to say about Asia to come give us their ideas and participate in our programs. But my question on this is, the way the Chinese have been using the anti-monopoly monopoly law in the last couple of years has looked less like a furthering of internal competition than it looks like a punishing of some foreign companies that, that there is a, but tell me what you think about that. Do you know what I mean? I think the, the, answer, I think the answer, answer just left. Yeah, the yeah. answer to <laughs> your question just left. Yeah. Uh, but we can ask Chris the question later. So. Chris, Chris. Take your question and get back to it. Right. <laughs> Anybody else? But Victor can answer it too. I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> can we talk about how you guys are seeing TPP? You know, you know, how much U.S. prestige is really involved in it? How much real economics is really involved in it? How critical is this to the pivot? So all those questions that are we're starting to refocus on now, because it looks like we might actually be getting TPA and, and TPP. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think it's, I think it's quite important. I mean, when you look at what, um, what is, what will be this administration's <laughs> legacy in Asia, and what will be the primary deliverable of the second term when you talk about Asia. You know, it's not so much the military rebalance or any of these other things. It really is this new institution, the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, as you know well, and I think as many people know, for the trade bureaucrats, this has always been part of a plan, you know, that started with things like Chorus, which had the initial template for how you do a high-quality, um, uh, broad-scoped uh, free trade agreement to uh, TPP and eventually to FTAP. And as Chris said, uh, you know, the Japanese government's decision um, to join TPP was a real watershed, I think, in the evolution of the organization because you now have the 
uh, two out of the three largest economies in the world talking about entering into a trade agreement. And it got a lot of people's interest. Um, um, so I, at least to me, undeniably, the, if, you know, for all that this administration has done in Asia, um, if at the end of it they get TPP, that's what people will write about. That's what academics will write about. That's what historians will write about. That is the most important institution. And as we all know, it's just not about trade. Yeah. You know, I think in the broader scheme of things, if it's something that does involve China, um, then you're talking about a broader strategic, uh, potentially strategic agreement because for China to sign on to a high-quality, high chorus-type free trade agreement would mean a lot of domestic changes in China, um, mm -hmm. much along the lines of international norms. So, so I think there's a lot at stake here. And personally, I'm quite happy to see that the administration now making soundings about a strategy for TPA and TPP. Skip, what are you hearing in Tokyo, about Tokyo? Are, are, are they really going to do what we keep being told they're going to do? They really will have agri reform, or is that you know, a placeholder to see what we do? Well, I, I do think that they're going to have ag reform in Japan. Um, if it's it may not look like what we expect it to be, as usual, in dealing with Japan. But I think that the pressure um, and the, the, you know, it's kind of a, it's, it's a kind of situation where, with, where China and Japan played off on each other a bit on this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when China expressed its, its interest in TPP, it heightened people in the Abe administration to try to get this under control, which had been have been floating around for so long, as you well know, and hadn't had any any, any resolution. So I, I think we'll see some kind of reform in, in the ag area. <coughs> yes, same. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm a rookie here. I'm not an old China hand or anything. I just have a question. How does the uh, desire to produce an innovation-oriented science and technology uh, center or enterprise interact with the traditional view of hundreds of millions of students who are used to a rote learning environment. Um. Well, I mean, this. I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's a. It's not something that just the Chinese face. It's something that we see in a number of countries in Asia, where there's a very active effort, often, often government-led, not just in um, systems like China, but also in democracies, where there really is an effort on creative innovation and trying to push um, uh, a generation of younger. Uh, um, students to think in much more creative rather than rote fashion. I think you see it in government subsidization, subsidizing um, um, uh, innovation and technology programs at schools. I think you see it in the active effort, particularly among countries like Korea and India and others, to send their students abroad. Um, so I think that this is the way a lot of them have addressed it. I don't, in the Chinese case, I think we're starting to see that with this really uh, top-down led effort at trying to create innovation. But I don't think that is qualitatively that different from what other countries in Asia have been trying to do that are not as closed political systems. So. Also, if you look at the universities in the US to, um, today, those who are techies like MIT, Caltech, um, Stanford, Berkeley, um, in the fields of science and technology, you can see uh, a lot of people are actually from, from Asia. So I should not, come, should not become a surprise that, uh, that um, they can actually in the future be the innovators and the creators in science and technology. In fact, Georgetown, I, when I teach at in, in the evening, most of the people in my bus are all Asians. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for your sharing. Um, I'm a visiting fellow at the CSIS from Taiwan. Um, 
uh, in terms of topic today is growth in Asia. Um, when I see um, the growth in Asia, I would like to divide it into three sectors. The first one is military, second one is politics, and the third one is economics. And in terms of economics, um, as we mentioned earlier, like a TPP, uh, I see TPP is not only a, a uh, protocol for international trade, but also it's kind of like a, a strategic tool uh, for um, like countries to compete and uh, cooperate to one another, like uh, between the United States and China mainly. So um, my question is, um, if in that sense, uh, TPP has been a, a strategic tool for countries uh, in terms of uh, economic growth in Asia. Uh, I was wondering whether the United States and Japan would be uh, would support like uh, other countries such as Taiwan to join the TPP in order to balance a little bit about the situation in Asia. Thank you. Well, uh, I think Taiwan would be a, a tricky one for the United States government. Uh, so I don't see. I don't see any dramatic move in that direction myself. It's always a touchy issue you know, for us in terms of our relationship with China. So I, I, that my estimation, it wouldn't be coming any time in the near term. What do you think, Victor? Um, I think that's probably right. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, if um, I'm speaking very plainly, I mean, if, if uh, in terms of rounding out TPP, the brass ring is China, then it's going to be hard to have a conversation about Taiwan. Uh, having said that, you know, you can't rule anything out. I mean, um, um, uh, you know, Taiwan has worked very hard to uh, bring itself to the table in, in all sorts of different international institutions with some degree of success. Um, and uh, if in the long term TPP has a sort of effect, transformational effect that people hope it will on not just the economic but also the strategic picture and the relationship between across the straits continues to improve, you know, we, we don't know what's possible in the future. So, um, to join TPP, do you have to be a internationally recognized state or can you be an entity of some kind? That's the immediate problem. That's the immediate problem. That's not the political problem. That's, yeah. that's the, yeah, the membership criteria problem. Right. So yeah. 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 Um, can I, I mean, can I, we still have a little bit. So I wanted to ask, uh, if I could, Apchai, on, on the issue of modernization theory. I mean, I, I, I thought how you described it was quite interesting and <clears throat> the role you attribute to migrant um, workers in that. But I wanted to ask you, if, I mean, you sort of set um, uh, Taiwan, Korea, South Korea, and Japan apart as sort of the poster childs for modernization theory, and then you have all these other cases. And then, but, and, and then you pointed out how, in some cases, like Burma, for example, we don't see things. But how much of that is really a factor of, you know, the, it's the time argument, right? That um, um, arguably none of these countries maybe with the exception of Indonesia, have reached the same level of democratic maturity as these other three countries. And that what we're seeing now, we're not looking at it longitudinally. What you're talking about are just sort of time series cuts at it. And that we still don't know over the long term whether these countries will not, uh, in, their, in the end, comport with modernization theory. I mean, you could have taken a slice of time in the 1980s in Korea when there was just starting to democratize or in Taiwan and said, this doesn't really look like modernization theory either. And I just wanted to know how you'd respond to that. <coughs> I, think, I think one of the interesting things about this theory is if you go, of modernization theory is, is, that, um, um, is that eventually, if you wait long enough, they will modernize, right? Mm. Um, or, dem or democratize any, you know, all societies. So if you just, just looking at time, for example, um, you know, if you just wait, for you know, for another hundred years, you can expect other societies in the world will probably modernize in a certain way. Whether they reach democracy is another question. Um, I, uh, what I see, you know, so I, I completely agree uh, with Victor in terms of you look in terms of Taiwan and Korea, 
fucking eighties. This isn't. It doesn't seem that uh, the theories may not hold well. Um, and you know, so I, I actually was very, extremely very skeptical in, in with the theory in the first place. And as I mentioned, I don't think that there's a correlation bet between the two. But I think the movement. I think the number. My point is that. Um, the idea for this structural change, a change in, in you know, you must have constitutions, you must have competing parties, you must have all of these institutions that, um, that comprise what you could consider as democracy. Um, that, those are big institutions, big things, and require a lot of a lot of uh, um, um, a lot of time. It's also a, a lot of um, resources as well as um, energy to to bring about. And um, but you know if you wait long enough, you know, it may not come so so soon. But I think what is you know in my own research, I think what is what I'm seeing is that um, the smaller change, the small uh, tinkerings, institutional tinkerings, like in political yeah. science, that's what we, we call them, um, uh, institutional tinkerings, and you just changes by uh, tip by uh, bit by bit, and even small change in policies will will have a change in maybe in decentralization and polarization of of, um, of voices within the deliberation process, um, and that um, that is just what actually yeah, I'm I'm reading, seeing is, um, in terms of just examining just <coughs> certain policies, particularly within Northeast Asia's uh, policy on citizenship and immigration. So you can you know, I can you can just like name those policies and how they came about is actually the movement by. NGOs where activists are fighting for those for those um, places, and they're not necessarily completely democracy yet. Like even in Thailand, as as mentioned before, uh, Thailand is still under authoritarian military um, military control. But you also also see movement within the countries on in terms of um, uh, pushes towards a more democratic. Uh, policies that be more inclusive toward migrant workers, for example. It's also to do with maybe also pressure from outside forces like the U.S. and uh, international uh, organizations trying to prevent uh, trafficking or human rights uh, violations. So we, you are, I'm seeing, I'm seeing that uh, the government are actually trying to change policies that become much more democratic and much more inclusive, mm -hmm. and in and under even under military uh, rules. And so if you just take away the structural component of it, the institution, the big institutions and so forth, so I'm looking terms of just policy, specific policies, and I actually see this, this is a movement toward democratic uh, deepening. Mm. And I think that's one whole point, and not to you know, support or, or no. uh, undermine either. either. Right. Yeah. Can I ask if you started out by talking about um, um, uh, 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 Jip, uh, the World Bank in Japan and the Olympics. And, so I wanted to ask you, the, so you know, when I left the U.S. government, I went back to Georgetown. The last thing I wanted to do was write a book about North Korea. So I wrote a book about politics and sports in Asia. And I was, right, and I was really sort of interested in the role that these Olympics have played in the development of Asia, right? Whether you're looking at 64 in Tokyo, yeah. 88 in Seoul, 2008 in Beijing is a little bit of a different story. But I wanted to ask you in sort of Tokyo in 64, you, you have these big things like uh, the elevated highway system and the bullet train and the hotels, but did did it have any sort of political impact in your view on uh, the politics of, of, of Japan and Japanese foreign policy? Yeah, I think it. I think it did um, because of the extent to which. Um, uh, the U.S. was also engaged on a bilateral basis mm -hmm. uh, in helping with the, this Olympic. Was, they all, the United States also saw this as a jumping off mm -hmm. thing for Japan. Mm -hmm. I must say, say I personally have a, a very deep interest in the Olympics. Um, I, I happened to work for the International Olympic Committee in Munich in 1972, and I saw mm -hmm. the raw side of politics mm -hmm. up front. Uh, at that time. Uh, I would, if I could, Victor, like to say a little bit about um, the uh, NGO community, if I could slide sure. off into that. Bit. Because it's, um, I, I really believe, that based on my experience at the ADB, that the more active the NGO community is in a given country and whatnot, it's almost, you can almost chart it to the extent to which their democracy is viable. Um, and that includes outside players and inside players. And sometimes the ADB management, uh, I'm looking at my friend Sam over here from the ADB, but uh, um, <clears throat> they, get, they can get frustrated. Mm. 
with the NGO community, quite understandably, because they can be quite pushy and whatnot. But we in the U.S. mission, we are always pushing um, the ADB management to include the NGO community from the get-go. Um, we think that if you don't, you're, you're going to you're going to you know invite a huge problem. So when when we when the, when the, the ADB is developing a project, a, a railroad system in Cambodia or a, a dam in Pakistan, we always urge the management to get to make sure the NGO community is the involved from the beginning. Mm -hmm. if, if you get them and if you talk to them at the end of the day, that you, then that's, it's too late. That's when you have a problem. So uh, you know, I just want to say that I, I certainly support the idea of the NGOs mm -hmm. being a, a sort of thermometer for a democratic development. Mm -hmm. right. We have a course in Georgetown just, just precisely on that. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for maybe one more. Yes. I'm uh, Mark Wall, most recently with the University of Wyoming, uh, but I'd like to toss out a rather broad gauged question and see who wants to pick up on it to invite your reactions. But uh, how, how, how do any of you see um, the security tensions in the region having an effect on the economic relationships? Um, do the tensions affect or threaten to affect the trade and investment flows, the dy uh, dynamism in the region, kind of the integration trends that have uh, prevailed for, uh, for, for so long in Asia and have been such an important factor in uh, Asia's growth? Um, anyone care to comment on that? Yeah, um, I, I think it has a, a, pretty, uh, uh, <coughs> a pretty strong impact. On the uh, on the region, and you see it in various ways. I think when, for example, when you uh, when you see the tension between the Philippines and in uh, China on the in the shoals off of uh, in the uh, Philippine Sea is what they call it at least, um, and then you see that as well off of Vietnam. I think it sends a real warning bell to the rest of the countries in the region, and I also think that. The, um, I think that one of the main, one of the drivers for Burma's opening was indeed their concern about being engulfed by the Chinese economic, what they would see as a sort of imperialism. And if you may recall, there was a dam that the Burmese had actually shut down, which came, was really the four, first step in that whole opening. And we were, we were very surprised. Um, in, in the ADB. In fact, um, uh, we watched it because for us, we have tons of sanctions on Burma. And uh, we were getting pressure, particularly from the Japanese, to move more rapidly to lift those sanctions on Burma. And I, I, I couldn't move, of course. You know, Washington couldn't help me move. Um, but uh, so I think that's a clear you know, example of how that the security issues have affected indeed. One thing though that I often tell my U.S. business colleagues, is, as you know Mark, I came from the business community before I was doing that too, but is that if anyone thinks that by blowing off China that Burma was therefore inviting the Japanese and the Americans to replace them, uh, I think they're smoking something. Uh, I don't think that's the case at all. And I think they've been trying to play balance. But you know, back to your original comment, yeah, I do think it has had an effect. I think if you look at the broad history of the region, you know, in the early post-war decade or two, when most of the trade was going from the region to outside of the region, the United States in particular, um, we saw a rapid economic growth and not much interaction between these countries. Uh, but now more and more of this trade is not just going outside the region, it's also internal to the region. And so in that sense, yes, the counterfactual would be, and it's pretty good now, but how much better could it have been if, um, if yeah. the political tensions were not what, uh, like they are, you know, in the, in the sort of social science Asian politics field, this is what's known as the Asian paradox, the fact that there is so much even today, economic interaction between the countries in spite of the fact that the political tensions still remain uh, quite high. Um, but I think I, I agree with Chip, I mean Skip, that 
it really is a question of how much better it could be uh, were it not for these tensions. Um, okay, so uh, to wrap up, uh, let me just remind everybody that uh, the, uh, our editors are hard at work on the next issue of the journal as well as future issues. Uh, and um, you are more than welcome to contribute, submit either shorter pieces or longer pieces uh, to the journal. Uh, for the long pieces, it's a peer-reviewed process, so, um, uh, so you, the outlet is a high-quality outlet. It's just not any old journal. Um, and again, I want to thank uh, Scott, Alex, <coughs> and the rest of the editorial team for all the great work they've done on that. I want to thank Daye also for all the supervision she's given to the project, and uh, congratulations to the journal, really. And to our speakers, thank you. Thank you.